Hi, this is Sodhan Bharti and welcome to another episode of TFR Insights. And today we have with us Mike Del Balso, co-founder and CEO of Tecton. Mike, first of all, welcome to the show. Tell me a bit about the company itself. Uh, when and why you founded the company? Uh, what problem you are trying to solve? Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so uh, Tecton is uh, a company about helping uh, organizations do what we call operational machine learning. And what that really means is uh, helping people put machine learning into production and using them for using machine learning for uh, solving real business cases, real customer facing uh, machine learning use cases. And um, we started the company uh, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. Uh, and, and really this founding team came out of Uber where we built the machine learning platform at Uber, which is called Michelangelo. What, uh, how Tecton helps teams uh, solve the operational machine learning problem is we help solve the data problems that are involved in the end-to-end -end machine learning life cycle. So machine learning, uh, you know, when you're building a machine learning application, you obviously have to build a number of models, but uh, you also have to build a set of um, uh, data pipelines to power those models, either to uh, build the training data sets to build your models, or to build the data pipelines to help those to feed those models with the data they need to make predictions, and so that's really the area that we focus on. We can we can dive deep on that, um, but uh, we're building a, a new category of, of data infrastructure for machine learning uh, in that layer. You mentioned a couple of things there, and I want to get into each of them one by one. First of all, how would you define operational ML? What is it? So operational ML, we think of as machine learning that is affecting the customer experience or a real business, uh, automated business decision. So uh, affecting like a real business process. And so these use cases tend to, tend to actually matter to the business, have real economic impact, but they also tend to be productionized. So, uh, you know, it's not just like, a, like a, a machine learning research project, but typically involves a variety of stakeholders in the development and productionization process. And that can be a team of data scientists, but also uh, engineers who are who are in, involved in productionizing these models. And then there's also um, like other other folks like legal and compliance and stuff that's needed in these use cases as well. But these use cases tend to be, or this type this type of machine learning project tends to be quite different from uh, some other uh, some other use cases for machine learning, like uh, kind of like research or even like offline analytics, um, because in, in many of these operational machine learning use cases, uh, a real time decision is made. We need to deal with data at different speeds. You know, this can be powering. So some examples here could be uh, making a live recommendation for a customer uh, when they go on an at when they go on a com e commerce website or um, or recommending an ad or live fraud detection or dynamic pricing. So these are like real fast decisions operating on maybe batch data, streaming data, and real time, just to help the company bring all of its data together to one place to make the best decision. I'm just curious, how, how different is it like operational ML from, you know, regular ML, if you can call it regular ML? Operational ML is just a, you can just think of it as a subset of machine learning. And so what is, maybe it's easier to think of it as like, what is not operational ML? And so we think of, uh, probably just two other kinds of use case, two other kinds of things for machine learning that we would not consider operational ML. Uh, and I've worked with like both both of these types of groups before. The first is uh, research. You know, if you're doing um, if you're in an academic organization, or even if you're in a company and you're part of that machine learning research organization, you're not. You, you may be developing new algorithms, but you're you're not thinking about how do I productionize this as a primary concern throughout your throughout the whole uh, effort throughout your whole project. And uh, secondly, uh, there's kind of another use case for ML, which is which is um, almost like analytic ML. And it's really just like ML that that is kind of like business intelligence plus plus. How do we use machine learning in an offline context to identify trends in our business data, maybe help us make a smarter report and, um, and, and uh, kind of build those kind of smarter forecasts into our offline reporting, dashboarding, and internal decision-making Whereas operational ML is really external facing. This is part. Of, this is something we make as part of our product. This is something that uh, could be the, the, a core fraud decision or a core pricing algorithm that powers the product itself. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. It will help me even more if you can just kind of give some use cases of operational ML. Yeah, so some use cases. Um, so I mentioned like a really big one is, uh, is fraud detection. I can talk about some public ones that we've gone through actually as we built out uh, the machine learning platform at Uber. So some really uh, kind of uh, um, easy machine learning use cases to relate to that some potentially like uh, Uber customers would have dealt with, you know, uh, quite regularly are in the app when you are requesting a ride, you know, we show a, an estimated time of arrival score, an ETA score. And that's an, that's an estimate of how long it takes the vehicle to go from A to B. There's also, um, there's also like an estimated time of, a, of uh, like a meal prep in like a Uber Eats kind of context. But there's also a variety of live pricing uh, models that are happening to generate the right, the right price uh, to balance, to do a lot of the, the market algorithms that uh, they want. But other common use cases, product recommendation, uh, ad tech, like click-through rate predictions, uh, and we're also seeing a lot of uh, a lot of um, insurance use cases resonating quite a bit. So that's kind of like live underwriting and also uh, live pricing from the underwriting. I want to know a bit more about the Uber use case because if you look at Uber's you know operation, the, the way they scale is unbelievable, especially when you mentioned Uber Eats also. <laughs> we have to wait so long just to get our order delivered. Uh, so, so talk a bit about what kind of work you did there, what technologies you used there. If I'm not wrong, you also you know use leverage Michelangelo there. Uh, but uh, uh, I also want to understand Michelangelo. So, so let's first talk about the U Uber's use case, and then we will get uh, deeper into Michelangelo. Maybe I can just back up a second and kind of describe some of the journey that Uber went through with machine learning, right? So, um, so I joined Uber in 2015 at a time when Uber was undergoing incredible growth, um, but there frankly wasn't a lot of machine learning uh, in production at Uber at that time. Of course, we had a handful of models, but uh, the really the machine learning muscle and that process was not there. So that led teams to be in kind of one of three different places. Either they had machine learning models that they had built and they had no way to productionize, or they had problems that, um, uh, or, or they had a, a team where they, it was a super important model and they built some kind of shaky tower of machine learning infrastructure, but it was, it was a little bit brittle and would not scale to even the next version of what they were trying to do. Uh, but the, I would say even the most common thing was this third scenario where um, teams identified machine learning use cases that were important for them. The core business problem they should solve with machine learning, but they chose not to get started with it because they didn't see machine learning as uh, low enough hanging fruit for them to work on. It was just too many barriers to entry, uh, too hard to get past the finish line. So, um, so part of what I did when I joined Uber was identify all of the, you know, try to identify all of the different machine learning use cases. Where could machine learning be helpful to the company? And uh, secondly, put together a plan for this machine learning platform, which is called Michelangelo. So over a number of years, we built out this platform called Michelangelo, which is really an end-to-end -end ML platform targeted to data scientists and machine learning engineers. And that allows data scientists to bring their business problem to this platform. So this is core infrastructure that is used across the company. But data scientists... Um, bring their business problem to this platform, translate it into a machine learning problem, and then point Michelangelo at their data, tell, tell Michelangelo how do we want to extract the relevant signals, which we call features in machine learning. How do we want to translate this data into predictive signals, build a model and deploy a model all in one platform and quite quickly. The really innovative part of that platform was, there's kind of two elements. One was we had a a one-click push to production. So previously, you might have to go through a team of engineers who uh, would take, you know, uh, depending on what their priorities were and how full their plates were, it could take months to get a project uh, model all the way into production, and that would slow down uh, these projects quite a bit and increase the cost of ML projects. Um, but secondly was the inherent centralization and standardization and therefore reusability built into this platform. So that allowed... Uh, that allowed data science teams, after they built uh, one model, one machine learning project, to take a lot of the predictive signals that they, they had extracted out of the business's data 
and make those reusable for another machine learning use case, another business problem that someone needed to solve with machine learning. And that was extremely common across a variety of organizations where they didn't have just a single model that they needed to build. For example, like a fraud detection use case. You know, there's not only one place that you want to be uh, detecting or predicting fraud. There's actually, uh, there, there may be many different user actions where you want to make a smart prediction. And, uh, and that reusability allowed, allowed a data scientists to uh, basically not start from zero, but start from almost like 90% done a project and reduce the cost to build machine learning. And that spread machine learning quite a bit across uh, Uber and to the point where there's tens of thousands of models in production making real-time decisions in Uber today. If you look at, uh, you know, from your perspective, you know, operational ML, it looks, everything looks like, you know, rosy and good, but I am pretty sure that there are a lot of challenges as well, which are kind of unique to operational ML, which are kind of different from, you know, <laughs> regular ML. Talk about some of the challenges also, especially in the context of data, because you're dealing with massive amount of data here. It's kind of common to hear people talk about, hey, 80% of you know, my machine learning project is, is me trying to prepare my data or mess around with data. And that's really the, the uh, part of machine learning that we are really focused on. So you know, our mission is to make operational ML easy for every company, but we're starting with uh, machine learning data because that's the biggest bottleneck for teams. And so we're building feature infrastructure. So at the core of that is a feature store, which makes feature pipelines, these data pipelines for machine learning, uh, reusable. And so we uh, see ourselves as, as the first real enterprise-ready feature store. And so there's fundamentally um, kind of three parts of that. There's a declarative feature engineering framework that allows teams to define which features they want to extract from, from their business data. And then we have a an orchestration engine that runs these feature pipelines and turns them into these predictive signals that are used for models. And finally, a platform that uh, makes Tecton a full enterprise-ready platform. So this is you know uh, all the compliance, governance stuff, web UI, and allowing for um, and a, a lot of like collaboration, reuse, and sharing capabilities as well. And so, why do you need this? Well, data is sp is especially hard for operational ML because uh, existing data pipeline uh, tooling uh, is just not it's just uh, not as useful for uh, the kinds of requirements for machine learning projects. So machine learning projects, you know, you might have to experiment with data offline and kind of in an analytic capacity. You might do this in a Jupyter notebook or something like that. But then when you productionize things, you have to, you know, what we see teams doing is the data scientist hands off that code to a team of engineers who rewrite those data pipelines in, in Java. And uh, they rewrite them in the production um, in the production environment. And so uh, I've heard I've heard some of our customers say, "Hey, our, our data scientists aren't able to contribute to the production to the production platform." And so they've described our our data pipelines as these ML ready uh, analytics pipelines or ML ready data pipelines. And so what does this allow for? Uh, faster development cycles, lower time to production lower operational cost, and uh, essentially easier adoption of machine learning across teams. So let, let's talk a bit about Tecton a bit. Uh, can you talk about what kind of you know, uh, solutions that are there that you build for your users and customers, and how, at what level do you engage with them? We meet our customers where they are. So we don't require that they are at a specific level of sophistication. What we found when we talked to uh, the market is that you know every company has a different set of bottlenecks that they are feeling immediately. And everyone has a different stack. Everyone's starting from a different place. So we have this uh, platform, which we uh, believe is a core foundation for, uh, a core data foundation for, uh, um, for building machine learning applications and productionizing them. But we help our customers uh, by helping them really like bring their data applications, build them and bring them into production on a platform like this. So we're not just uh, deploying our software and leaving. Um, we, we are helping them uh, be successful and, and actually build this stuff, but also our platform is uh, software as a service. So all of that technology, all of that, um, uh, that whole stack is being managed by our team. And uh, it takes a lot of the maintenance burden and the upgrade burden and all of that uh, off from the customer. 
And uh, so like Atlassian's a great example. They, um, uh, they have a, a variety of models that power Jira and Confluence that, um, that are running using uh, data pipelines that run on Tekton. And um, they are making hundreds of millions of predictions every day to do live real-time personalization and building that into the product. And, um, and so we, the kinds of customers that we're working with are folks in financial services, uh, banking, ad tech, online retail, and, uh, and some and technology companies as well. So if you're offering SaaS, where, how does your own infrastructure look like? Where do you run all these services? And how do you ensure uptime and all the uh, demand that uh, comes from the users? Yeah, so we have a, uh, I guess you could say a tiered deployment model where our product is, is actually, um, the Tekton platform is actually two parts, a data plane and a control plane. And so this is uh, one of our uh, common deployment patterns is we deploy our data plane into our customers' uh, cloud accounts. So in a VPC in their account. So that part of the product is the part that connects to the customer's data, processes the customer's data, and serves those feature values back to them. It's really the production part of their machine learning application. And so uh, our, our, you know, our team operates that software and maintains production SLAs for it. And there's separately a control plane, which does some of the orchestration, handles some of the metadata, and powers some of the um, some of the kind of cataloging and web UI kind of stuff. And, and that lives in uh, outside in, in our Amazon account. And it's not part of like the the core, um, per, I guess you could say like production data flow. Um, that and so we find that that deployment model provides the right um, balance between. Um, comfort for our customer and ability, comfort for our customer in terms of like their data policies and security and where they want their data to be. And also uh, flexibility and, and power for us to be able to uh, support this software, upgrade it as needed, and really be able to provide a service where uh, we can commit to certain uh, production SLAs. Uh, Mike, Thank you so much for uh, talking about operational ML, uh, the work that you're doing there with Tecton and, and this, you know, uh, the whole space of machine learning. And uh, ML is, you know, a big focus area for, for me here at TFIR. So I look forward to talk to you again to understand, to deep dive uh, into all these technology that you're building there. Once again, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. 